this guy, he's one of these hooligans, man. He's like talking crap on social media. I've seen him here. Doesn't really address me as a man, you know. I wanted to talk to him kind of, you know, and he's just like dodging me and like, whatever, we can handle it after the fight. So I'm doing my interview, and this hooligan comes by saying some stuff, and July, get your ass kicked to July, July. And I go, maybe, bro, whatever, because maybe I want to kick your ass in April. Maybe I don't want to wait till July. Maybe I don't even want to fight you in a prize ring because you're not worth a training camp. I'll just fight you here because you're a scrub, you know. So I tell him, just say it to my face. Like, oh, man, you're saying it, walking away. That's not like... We're both men, you know? And uh, as, I, as I'm as i walking up to him, I got my hands behind my back to signal I'm, I'm not coming here for problems. But he put his hands up like this. It's on video, and he walks towards me. Well, where I'm from, if you do that, you're going to punch me in the face, and that's not going to happen, Leon. You're a dork. You're JV Beta. You're, you are what you are, bro. You're just a loser in life, man. You're not going to get a hit off me, you know? So I had to give him the three-piece with the soda. And then just glide out of there, you know. And then some of his friends tried to sucker punch me. Those guys did a big mistake because uh, your visa in America is now revoked. Because if you land in America, it's going to be some problems. I mean, there's problems here already. But those people can't go to America no more, you know. I probably shouldn't be saying this on video, but their visa just got revoked. Mm. What's going on, everybody? This is episode 61 of Combat Docket Radio. Ben and I are finally back. After a brief hiatus, sometimes life kicks you in the ass, knocks you down, but you got to get back up. We're here, ready to talk about some MMA because we missed some big things. Uh, I mean, didn't miss big things because obviously we both watched everything going on, but we haven't been able to talk about a bunch of big things happening in the MMA world in the last few weeks. But what's up, man? Not much. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm ready to, to jump back into it, talk about all kinds of shit that's been happening. And I feel like it's been... Not like a, a ton of crazy stuff, but like every week there's it feels like there's a big news story such that, you know, we haven't we haven't been able to talk for a few weeks and it feels like I'm already forgetting stuff that just happened a couple of weeks ago. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, I know, man. Uh, it's wild, man. Uh, a lot of MMA going on each and every week. So we're going to do it like this this week. Uh, instead of like going back and backtracking, trying to like break down all these cards we didn't get to talk about, yada, yada, yada. We are going to each pick three things to bring up and talk about um, that we've missed talking about in the last couple weeks. So if you don't mind, Ben, I'm going to start first because I'm pretty sure you and anyone that's listened to this show is going to know where I'm going. So if you don't mind, I, like uh, I, got, I got an idea where you're starting and yeah, go for it. And I am going to talk about the main event of UFC 235. The best damn welterweight on the planet, Ben Askren, finally made his UFC debut. Got a big win. And honestly, man, I am a little upset. Not upset. Like Ben deserves all this love, but like. Where was everybody the last, I don't know, 10 years that Ben has been doing this? You know, everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon now, but I've been driving the bandwagon, man. Uh, I've been pumping Ben up for, for years upon years upon years. And like I said, I'm happy for him. Uh, but man, this is Ben Askren. This is what people have been missing. This is what the UFC has been missing. He is so great. Like... His gimmick is freaking awesome. It's hilarious. He's so funny. Uh, he's obviously a great fighter. Um, you know, I guess the big thing we have to talk about is the actual finish, right? Because, you know, uh, it was it was rough, man. It was rough. Robbie Lawler uh, knocked the shit out of Ben Askren. He dunked him on his fucking head. But to Ben's credit, man, he stayed in it. Uh, fight probably could have been stopped. I thought it was going to be stopped, man. I was I was watching through like my uh, my fingers. Um, but hey, man, to Ben's credit, like I said, he pulled through. He got his wits back about him. He got back up. Uh, I believe he's uh, you know went for a takedown and got into that weird. It was a bulldog choke, man. Um, I was completely fine with the stoppage. Again, I'm a bit of a Ben Maskin mark. I will agree with that. But dude, Robbie Lawler's hand goes limp. He was out. He popped back up quick, but he was out. Judgment call. Uh, you know, we can we can sit here on our couches and make all these assumptions when we have instant replay and this and that, and we're not in the cage. But I mean, judgment call when it happened. That was uh, 
That's a tough call for Herb. I mean, you know, either way, whether Rob, Robbie or uh, Herb stopped it or didn't stop it, I'm fine with it. And honestly, whether I'm a, you know, Ben Askren, Mark, or even if it was the flip side, if, you know, if Robbie choked Ben out like that, which he wouldn't because Ben's the best welterweight on the planet and will not lose until he's wearing that title. <laughs> I honestly wouldn't have a problem with it. Uh, give me your thoughts on Ben and the actual finish of that fight. Oh man, a lot to unpack there. So I'll, I'll start with the finish. Um, I think I think I think you're right that all of us watching it live, like I definitely, I think if you were watching it live, you definitely thought that Robbie Lawler was out when you see his hand go limp. Um, then you know more and more kind of these like Zapruder film like replays of, of people looking at the finish and trying to figure out was Robbie unconscious or not, or how bad did Herb Dean fuck up? Obviously, Herb kind of messed up because as soon as as soon as Ben Askren released the choke, which he held long because I think Askren knew that it, at least at that point that Lawler was not out. Um, you know, Lawler clearly popped up to his feet, so it was it was a blown call, I guess technically, but. Even like the the replays where Herb Dean checks Robbie Lawler's hand and Lawler kind of gives a thumbs up, but it's not like an immediate response. I don't know. I think it was an excusable mistake on Herb's part. I actually think if you think back to like uh, Michael Chiesa and Kevin Lee, if you remember that, I can't remember who the ref was in that fight. Um, uh, Mazagati. No, not Mazagati. Yamasaki. I they, I, oh, yeah. I think you're right. Um I feel like that was more egregious than this. This one, it looked like everybody watching it live definitely thought Lawler was unconscious the way his arm went limp. So definitely a mistake on Herb Dean's part, but I think a pretty excusable one. Um, and then on Ben Askren catching on, yeah. I don't th- I don't know if I ever really uh, doubted Askren's fighting abilities, but I doubted how big of a star he would be. And I'm not saying he's like a John Jones or McGregor level type of star, uh, but a, there was a ton of just kind of like buzz about him from casual fans that I like personally interacted with as well as people like on Twitter that are not usually as involved. Also, I don't know if you saw, I can't remember some, some media member with either MMA junkie or MMA fighting posted um, all the, the, the like YouTube clips from UFC 235 and all the post fight interviews and whatnot. And Askren had like so many more views on his videos than even John Jones and Tyron Woodley and Kamaru Usman. So I know. I, I think Way his more. gimmick is really, and it's not even a, it's, it's hard to describe his quote unquote gimmick because part of it is just that he seems super genuine. Um, and like, almost like he's not tr- like, he knows some of his like boom roasted jokes are corny as hell. And he's like embraces that. They're so funny. Yeah. Though. It's funny because he knows, right. Like he's, the way he tells them is good. Like he's really catching on. Um, and also something that I didn't really think about, but the, the UFC is doing a good part in, in Oh yeah. The too. social media and stuff. Um, I know the Twitter account is, was interacting with him leading up to this. Um, but even like you, I think people tend to think of Askren as kind of a boring fighter, but this fight highlighted for us how exciting it can be because he just like, it's almost like the equivalent of a knockout punch when he gets a hold of somebody. Like it was, it was such high drama right away because immediately he was in Lawler's face trying to take him down, and it led to a super chaotic, really short fight. Um, right, and and he'll tell you too. He's not going to deviate from that style. Right. He'll tell you his striking sucks, but I mean, it's tough to game plan for a guy like that because his wrestling is so intense, it's so good, um, and like you said, he's in your face. Uh, constantly and he makes it exciting man look at his record I mean his last uh, you know I don't have him pulled up right now but I mean he's got like I don't know seven of his last eight fights finishes again it's not the hot top level competition but uh, he's finishing fights so this whole boring <laughs> shit and obviously his his personality translates really well Um, I'm so pumped for it man it was it was crazy to see him in the uh, octagon it was nuts yeah, for sure. Um, I guess this might lead into another topic, but who do you who do you want him to fight next? Yeah, that's where I was going as well. Um, so there's a couple different things. Uh, I'm sure either you or I are going to bring it up. Um, you know, this whole Jorge Masvidal, where does he fit in? Leon Edwards, where does he fit in? Um, I think Masvidal makes sense, but, you know, Masvidal given... 
Leon Edwards, the three piece and a soda. Um, that's the route I would go with that. So for me, that cancels out um, those two. You know, briefly again, I think we're going to talk about this a little more. Uh, you got to do Colby Usman. Um, man, it's tough. Uh, I don't even know. Let me pull up the ranking. I mean, it's it's hard. I th- like the only because I'm looking at them right now. Okay, okay. So give me, give me. I know Askren is now at what six? Yeah. Right? Like who? Give me the top. Give me the top five. Give me, give me, give me. Well, yeah, give Usman me is a champion. Then, Woodley, see. he's not going to yep. fight. Coving- Covington, fight. we kind of assume is going to fight Woodley. Stephen Thompson, who's fighting Anthony Pettis for some reason this weekend. RDA, who just signed to fight Kevin Lee. Kevin Lee. And then Jorge Masvidal. That's one through five. Okay. Give me. <laughs> and give then, me seven and then ten, Darren Till. Santiago Ponzinibbio. Does Ponzinibbio nope. have a fight right now? Ah, oh, that's a good question. I and then and then Robbie Lawler, Leon Edwards. Okay, so right off the bat, I have zero, less than zero interest in the Robbie Lawler rematch. Like, Ben has, there was no heat there. Ben didn't, you know, that's the one guy in the division that Ben talked no shit about. He openly said that. I have no interest in them doing, you have to put, Ben has, Ben has built heat with so many guys in that division. Yeah. Um. Man, that's a good question. I feel like I feel like it's it's gonna be probably e- either Masvidal or um, Edwards Ponzinibbio. Ponzinibbio does not uh, have a fight. Um, I mean, I guess you could do Ponzinibbio. I guess, that but that's sense. another one that like I don't see any steam. Yeah, there's no heat there. Ponzinibbio is not going to talk. You got to get somebody that is going to jar back and forth with. Like I again, I feel like Masvidal is the guy because you know Masvidal is going to talk shit with him. Darren Till was the guy. That was the dude. Yeah, um, yeah. And that uh, makes no sense. Like nobody wants to see that now after Darren Till. No, uh, got his. I mean, off. hey man, don't literally, dude. Don't put it past the UFC if 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 you see Ben Askren fighting Kamaru Usman for the title next. Um, I said it before, man. Colby Covington is like a poor man's Ben Askren. <laughs> They've already stripped him of the title, like. Ben's more popular than Colby. He's better on the mic than Colby. He's a better fighter than Colby. Don't put it past them uh, giving Ben Askren the next title shot. Um, his star, like we said, man, his star power seems to be working. Why not capitalize on it? Um, man, you know what? I mean, this makes zero sense, but could you just imagine Ben Askren, Mike Perry, him <laughs> roasting Mike Perry leading up to that fight? <laughs> It makes no sense, but man, they don't even need to fight. Just have them argue. I'd be down with that. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know, man. I would say Ponsonibio, but at this point, dude, you honestly, dude, yo, give me fucking, you know what? Give me Masvidal, Usman, go for it, and give me fucking Colby versus uh, Askren. That's a that's a shuffling that. that I had not considered. Um, and it would no, be a shocker. I don't, I don't think Col- Colby Colby's not taking no. that fight either. That would be a shocker, but um, I, don't know. I mean, it seems like the UFC is kind of doing shocker, not shocker fights, but fights that you don't expect a lot uh, lately. For me, I think, I think even though Masvidal and Leon Edwards had their their little tiff, I don't know if it's big enough for them to book Masvidal against Leon Edwards. I think the fight that makes more sense is Askren and Masvidal. And Covington and Woodley, and the winner, the winner between Asker and Masvidal fight for the title. Um, oh, so you're not even do, you're not doing Usman Covington right now? No. Oh, sorry, I say okay. I said Woodley. Sorry, Covington, okay, okay. Covington, yeah, yeah. Usman. Okay, okay. I'm gotcha. looking at the rankings. Okay, but here's another thing too. Like, why the fuck did we not do uh, Colby versus Woodley and oh. <laughs> Askren versus Marty? That, that, like, that would have made too much sense. And too much sense. Colby right Covington. I think he's going to lose to Kamara Usman if they fight, but. Covington like had basically the same exact marquee wins as Kamaru Usman, only he had them first. Like there was no reason other than just uh, politics or whatever why Covington didn't get the title shot here. I know, man, but honestly, like love him or hate him, any fight that Colby Covington's in right now in that division, I'm all for. He's got heat with everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, he's super corny, but you know what? He's got heat At- with everybody. He's got heat with Askren. He's got heat with Usman. Yeah. He's got heat with Woodley. Um, 
the man deserves his title shot. Give him the title shot. Yeah. Yeah. I'm down with that. I think Masvidal Askren makes sense because I think Masvidal would be hilarious uh, with Askren. I think that'd be a great pairing. Yeah. Man, you're right. Askren with a lot of those guys. I mean, I don't think... I think there was a lot of buzz around this fight, around Askren Lawler. And like you said, there was basically no heat there whatsoever. So there's lots of options for him. Um, no, dude, Ben's doing his part, man. He's great. Yeah. And I'm glad people, I'm glad, but I'm also like, where the fuck were you guys this whole time that I've been spouting about Ben Askren? Yeah. Ben, we've been doing this podcast since like, what, 2016? And I was talking about Ben Askren back then? <laughs> Come on, guys. Like the first fucking episode, I believe. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, because that was right around his uh, when he was going to retire. I think when his retirement fight got announced or something. Yeah, that um, sounds right. Look, or, look, who, look where we are now. Look where we are now. <laughs> he will be the champion in 2019. Yeah, and I will say I told you also. Um. Anyways, all right, you're up. First point. Um. So let's talk a little bit about like the. There's been a lot of happenings, and let's talk about the state of the UFC lightweight division because. Um, let's see here in just a couple weeks, we have Max Holloway moving up, right? Fighting for the interim title, um, against Dustin Poirier, which Poirier definitely earned his shot. Holloway, not so much maybe, but still a great fight that we're all going to watch. Um, and then stuff that's happened in the past couple weeks is, you know, we kind of wondered why Tony Ferguson got passed over by that fight, uh, or for that fight rather came to light that Ferguson, has a, I believe a temporary restraining order against him right now. Um, placed on him by his wife, uh, nothing physical, but apparently he is going through all kinds of issues. Um, also in legal problem in legal troubles was Ke- Connor McGregor got arrested in fucking Miami for smashing a fan's phone. Um, it kind of seems like that's going to blow over, but uh, I think it's, it's kind of mayhem at that division right now. But I think I I tend to think it'll all kind of sort itself out. Um, it should anyway. We talked about this when Khabib originally said he wasn't going to come back until I believe like November. That an interim fight maybe made sense in this division. So the interim title kind of makes sense here. Um, however, like how confident are you that the winner between Poirier and Holloway will actually fight? End up fighting uh, Khabib. <laughs> I'm not confident at all, man. And any, again, like I know that Tony's going through some shit and, you know, I wish him the best. Um, it doesn't sound good. Like it sounds, it, it sounds, sounds like, weird, honestly, man. it sounds like um, some sort of, and obviously neither of us are fucking doctors, but it sounds like some sort of like drug issue, right? Like the, the reports of him having hallucinations and, Doing all kinds of, of of wild stuff sounds like there was a weird cocktail of drugs. Yeah, man, it's weird. Um, I wish him and I wish his family the best. Um, I hope he gets through it, but it's weird having any sort of title fight, any sort of interim title fight uh, in that lightweight division without Tony Ferguson involved in it. I mean, the guy's on what eleven fight win streak or something like that, and. Uh, I mean, just not have him in in this title picture right now is weird. And no, I'm not confident at all uh, with the winner of Max and Poirier <laughs> getting a title shot. I mean, who knows what the hell Khabib's going to do? You still have Connor kicking around. I'm going to I'm going to address Connor in a second because um, I do have a lot to say about that. But um, yeah, I'm not confident at all, man. I love that Poirier Holloway fight. Again, it's kind of interesting that. You know, that was Max Holloway's first fight in the UFC, what, in 2000, was it 11 or 12 or 13 or something like that? Either way, a long time ago. They both progressed a lot. I mean, Dustin Poirier is the guy. Uh, he deserves this. Um, Max Holloway, not so much. Um, but again, I love the fight. I don't enjoy him skipping the queue, especially at a division like that. And also, like, I don't think he or the UFC has closed the book on him jumping back back down to 45. I mean, he's still the champ. We have Volkanovski Aldo coming up, which is an excellent fight. There's a bunch of contenders down there. Um so I don't know, man. It's it's all weird, but again, there's no rhyme or reason um in that division. It's it's chaos and it shouldn't be chaos when it's such a good division. Um 
And then Connor, dude, like, man, Connor is just too, I don't know what the fuck's up with him, man. I mean, I do. I think he just got too big for his own good, man. And it's, um, you know, he's, he's a guy that's kind of teetering on the brink of, uh, how long are we going to care about him? You know, he hasn't won a fight in how long, you know what I'm saying? It's uh, two years. Constantly getting in trouble. Uh, you know, it just seems like his whole focus is outside of MMA, but he also still wants you to care about him. Like, you know, if Connor comes back, I mean, the, the here's the thing: the UFC and the division is going on without Connor, and I don't think Connor wants to accept that, right? And how long are we going to care? Like, let's say Connor comes back and loses another fight, like the luster's kind of gone, no? I don't think it'll be gone, but it'll it's it'll but to an extent yeah. it's it's diminishing. Yeah, it'll be it'll be hurt. Um for sure. And like I think you and I both thought Connor was going to fight end up fighting Cowboy Cerrone, but in another twist, Cowboy Cerrone is now scheduled to fight Ally Quinta. They could still he could still fight McGregor if he gets back to I Quinta, but Okay, okay, but but here's the thing with that. And I and I agree with Connor on this point. Oh, Apparently yes. they wanted to book Connor in the co-main event. Which he's still the biggest okay, star. You That's what Conor I think. McGregor so in a co-main event, even, right? he's the biggest star in in MMA yeah. history. He does not, no matter what kind of shit he does. Like if Conor McGregor is fighting in the UFC, title no title, he is the main event. He has earned that. One hundred percent. I don't agree with him being in a uh, co-main event fight. So I get him not wanting that yeah. cowboy fight. Uh, which is still like honestly, I think he could still lose a couple of fights and still be maybe still the biggest star in MMA. I think he he kind of transcends as far as like his like legal stuff. I think he's just he's kind of got the John Jones gift and curse where he kind of acts like uh, consequences don't necessarily apply to him. And I think to some regard that makes him a really good fighter, but obviously it can catch up to him. And I hope he doesn't kind of go the John Jones route where. We miss out on like long stretches of stretches of his career due to legal issues, um, which is already affected. You know, uh, it's affected. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think at the end of the day we're gonna get Nate. I hope. I think that makes year. the most sense. Um, I hope so. It makes the most sense. Just, just Nate doesn't want to fight anybody. Connor doesn't want to fight anybody. It's gonna make the most money. It's gonna do a killing. Uh, we don't need to do any sort of yeah. belt and make it um, make it the main event of like a huge pay per view. I don't care if there's no title right. on the line. It's still but, it was a great but fight. But there there could be a yeah. title. That's that's the biggest fight in MMA. Put a fucking title <laughs> at the Coleman event. Yeah. You know, obviously you're not gonna use one of your big stars like Cormier or Jones or anything. But put put the fucking welterweight title. That's fight. a big fight. Yeah, Colby Colby versus Usman at the Coleman event. Connor Nate three main event. That card would do probably two million buys, It'd be huge. or close to it. I mean, that's the fight to make. Let's do it. Yeah, uh, but sometimes, man, it just feels like it makes too much sense, uh, and the UFC cannot pull it off for whatever reason. I know. Yeah, sense and the UFC does not go together no. anymore. Um. All right. Point number two, or topic number two, I should say, came out yesterday that. I guess I should uh, – no, I'm not going to go and comment. I'm going to backtrack to something later. But TJ Dillashaw has popped for something, right? He was flagged by USADA and he has voluntarily – um, he has voluntarily relinquished his 135-pound title. Um, not a good couple <laughs> months for TJ Dillashaw. Uh, lost the fight to Henry Cejudo. And now he has popped for USADA. He has a year suspension from, I believe, the New York State Athletic Commission. And uh, I guess a, and that's retroactive to his fight with Henry Cejudo. I believe he's also going to get a slap from uh, USADA. Um, man, so that's really going to open up that division. Uh, tough for TJ. And the big question is, who is Marlon Marais going to fight for the vacant title? Is it going to be Cejudo or is it going to be Pedro Munoz, uh, Aljamain Sterling, uh, I don't know, any fun fight, John Lineker, I don't know, a lot of fun fights. I mean, I hope, I, I, I think we're all assuming that it's Marlon Moraes, and I think everybody assumes that. 
hundred percent it's Marlon Marais. For me though, like when I first I I I thought when I first read this news about Dillashaw popping um and giving up his title, I I automatically assumed, all right, that kills the chances of a Sehudo Dillashaw rematch. But apparently it's it a lot of people are on board with Sehudo still coming up to one thirty five and fighting for the title there. I'm not a huge fan of that fight really at all, but I guess if they're killing the flyweight division, Sohudo has to go somewhere. But personally, I'd much rather see Marais fight uh, Pedro Munoz. Um, yeah, I'm all for that Pedro Munoz fight. Man, man. 135 is so good. And I understand none of those guys are like huge stars. Like that fight that we just mentioned, they're not going to put that on a pay-per-view main event. Um, but I don't care. Like 135 is so good. Just let those guys fight. Like all those guys you just named, Aljamain Sterling, Pedro Munoz, Marlon Marais, Absolute killers, all looking great. Studs, we got Peter Yan coming up. Made, um, like, just let that division like, work know, itself out. I would really oh, yeah, prefer if Cejudo just stays yeah, at 125, but it, it, it on really everything. feels come like the UFC day, wants so to go on with Cejudo uh, at 135. Out, even you know? even though it's not a rematch, it like even it. though there's not, you know, there's no heat now between Cejudo and Marais. There's no heat, and like you said, Pedro Munoz deserves a shot. I wouldn't be uh, – Aljamain Sterling got knocked out quick, but, man, that guy is grinding. He's improved a shit ton. Um, yeah, I'm, dude, I'm down, man. Pedro Munoz, Marlon Marais, that's the fight to make. But, hey, how about this clip? I'm going to play this real quick. Kind of funny now. Uh, listen to this now. So one year ago, Cody No Love accused TJ Dillashaw of showing everyone at team. I mean, it, at the time, it <laughs> sounded really stupid. It still kind of sounds stupid, but I mean, I don't know. Cody might have known something. TJ's pop. Cody hasn't. Um, kind of crazy. Yeah, I mean, we, I, I kind of assume it's given that uh, Dillashaw has a pretty short suspension and a pretty small fine. It kind of my guess is that it was some sort of diuretic or something to deal with his weight cut. Um, but we all know that those can be like masking, masking agents for all kinds of steroids, but yeah, fuck man. And I'm bummed. Uh, but I really hope this, this kind of paves way for the bantamweight division to get moving. Agreed, man. And I think it will. Um, next. Um, so my next topic I'm going to quick shout out to UFC uh, Wichita because I was there. Um, not a phenomenal card, but there were some fun fights. A um, couple things, big takeaways from that event real quick. Junior Dos Santos did kind of what made sense and, and demolished Derek Lewis really quickly in a super bizarre fight that had Derek Lewis like hunched over at one point and Junior Dos Santos like afraid to attack him. It was really bizarre. Very, very weird. Very bizarre. But, um, you know, I think that's kind of the end of Derek Lewis, us viewing him as an elite heavyweight. Um, and how he about did... the resurgence of Junior Dos Santos? Yeah. I mean, he's still got, he's still a really, really good athlete. Um, and seeing him live, you know, he I saw Junior Dos Santos fight live at the very first UFC I went to. Um, I saw him knock out Mirko Krokop. Um, he's still like shockingly fast for a heavyweight, the way he moves. Because also on that card was like Ben Rothwell and Blagoy Ivanov. Um, and comparing the way that they move to, to the, the way that JDS still moves is, is pretty shocking. Um, but I actually think the for me the biggest takeaway from Wichita was in the co-main event, a guy that myself included didn't really know about um, Elizu Zaleski Dos Santos, who I like to call ZDS, um, is a welterweight now on a seven-fight win streak in the UFC, um, and it's like and he just blew through Curtis Millinder. Um, it, who who Curtis Millinder man? I was yeah. very high on. I was like, I know uh, Dos Santos is is a stud. Like he was an underdog. He man, was, ZDS was an underdog. He was, and rightfully so, dude. Curtis Millinder is a fucking and, badass. And he he mowed yeah. through him. 
That was super yeah. ZDS impressive. kicked him a couple times, took him down, and immediately submitted him. Um, and I think like the guy. I'm not saying he's going to be a future champion or anything like that, but seven fucking wins in the UFC's welterweight division in a row is nothing to shake your head at. Um, and I like I wouldn't even mind if they start like throw him in the deep end, throw him against somebody like a Robbie Lawler. I'm not saying make that fight in particular, but um, you know, a guy. That would be a, a yeah, banger. A guy of that level, like I would love to see ZDS just just thrown in there. Um, so, for me, that was a big takeaway from the event. Other than that, was one of the drunkest UFC crowds I've ever been a part of. Um, that crowd, that crowd was not very. Good. <laughs> it well, it was a small venue, so it was cool. But yeah, it was like people were up and down, like getting uh, like double fisting beers. No, I, I saw I saw your videos. Dude. Just so many <laughs> drug folks. But the takeaway. If you watch it on TV, uh, ZDS, Zaleski Dos Santos, keep an eye out for him. The guy uh, puts on phenomenal fights. Is on like, Again, I cannot stress enough how crazy it is he's gonna, he, that he's on a seven-fight win streak and not many people know about him. Uh, ZDS, Leon Edwards, yes, seven-fight win streak. I'm down with that. that I'm division. absolutely down with that. Um, so I'm not even saying they should fight, but hey, man, who knows? Um yeah, I mean, you never know, man. It's definitely time for him to get a step up. I mean, those are two guys that are... I mean, seven fights in a stacked division like welterweight. And in the UFC in general, that is really hard to do. And you got two guys in that same division that are on seven fight win streaks that are getting no love. I mean, Leon Edwards is to better. an extent his, his is win starting streak to get a little love. For sure, but... Yeah. But man, even if you're fighting fucking tomato cans seven fights in a row, that's pretty tough, man. In the UFC, that's 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 no easy yeah, feat. Yeah, for sure. All right, my last big point, and I guess if we missed anything, we can go back on it. Um, and this is kind of I'm going to bring a bunch of things into this, I guess, and maybe it's a little bit cheating, but uh, the goat returned. John Jones returned at UFC 235. Um, had a dominant win over Anthony Smith. But it's tough, man, because, like, I mean, I'm hoping that John Jones is back, right? Like, you know, we all hope that John Jones is back and he's not going to fuck up. But you never know with John Jones. But John Jones dominates Daniel Cormier, knocks Daniel Cormier out, stops Alexander Gustafson, and then it almost seems like, I don't know if he just wasn't interested or he just kind of, Care like it felt like John Jones could have finished that fight with Anthony Smith at any point, and he just didn't. So I don't know if like I want to be impressed with just the the consistency and the longevity of John Jones's reign because I mean there is nobody even close to that man in MMA. Or I want to be slightly like disappointed that he didn't go out there and just put on a show and and stop Anthony Smith. Um, and then on the flip side, man, props to Anthony Smith, dude. You know, he was hit with that illegal knee and it's, you know, people have talked about it in his treatment. He could have stayed down. Um, he could have won the title, but he said he didn't want to win a title like that, man. He got up. He barely even took any time too, and he got blasted with that knee. Um, I mean, the Lionheart thing, it definitely rings true. So props to Anthony Smith, but John Jones, what did you think about his performance? Were you impressed? Were you disappointed? Or was it just, you know, status quo for John Jones? I actually think um, I think and I, I think uh, Connor Rebush, who's a he writes for uh, Bloody Elbow and maybe Sure Dog, had a good point that John Jones like is not he's not a super powerful guy. He obviously has some really good like slick technique and some of his judo throws and like elbows from top can be super powerful. But in terms of like punching and kicking, striking power, he's not a super powerful guy. Um, and he je- I think he just needs somebody to, to really come out of their shell and get after him for him to get finishes like that. Like think about him head kicking Daniel Cormier. That was with Cormier moving into him. Um, even like the, the punch he landed on Leota Machida way back in the day to hurt him. That was a counter. Um, so I, I, I think, I don't know if, I don't, I don't think John Jones was necessarily being uh, like lazy or anything like that against Anthony Smith when he couldn't get the finish. Um, I think Anthony Smith kind of went into a defensive shell, but yeah, props to him. When when Anthony Smith got hit with that illegal knee, like I immediately told anybody that would, I was like, this fight's over. Like it's, this has got to be a DQ because it was such a blatant knee. Wow. 
I thought it was over. I was too. like, this is this fight's over. He's gonna. There's no way he's gonna want to continue after this. Imagine that John Jones two losses, yeah. <laughs> two DQ. It's it's per- <laughs> like we started. Remember when I said Conor McGregor has a John Jones syndrome where he acts like there's no consequences. This is exactly what I'm talking about. John Jones throwing a blatant illegal knee. Um, and I don't think it was necessarily malicious or anything like that. No, but, but I think he's just, he just acts like, well, obviously it's technically malicious because he's in a fight. Everything is malicious, but, um, you know, right. He wasn't like purposely, I'm going to break the rules. I think that's just, he has a little short circuit in his brain sometimes. And part of that makes him an incredible fighter. Um, but yeah, man, I think actually, I think my takeaway on John Jones, uh, is that I'm happy. Like he just seems like he's now back to, he just wants to fight the next challenger. Like he didn't care if he, if he fought Anthony Jones or Daniel Cormier. Now he just wants to fight the next guy and the next guy and the next guy. Um, he's kind of, well, he's kind of like Max Holloway in that regard. Like just, he's right. taking on all comers, which I don't think, which I love. Yeah, John Jones does not get enough credit for that. No, he doesn't. But that's the next point. Like what is next for him? Because he's, I mean, dude, he's proven time and time again. Like there is no light heavyweight, on the planet that can hang with him. And that includes Daniel freaking Cormier, who if there was no John Jones would be arguably the goat, but there is a John Jones and he destroyed Daniel Cormier two times. So what's next for John Jones? I mean, you have Johnny Walker, you have Dominic Reyes, two bright prospects, but are either of those guys ready for John Jones? Absolutely not. He just destroyed Gustafson. Like, does he stick around and wait for, you know, Dominic Reyes even said like he wants, he, he was on the MMA hour. He said, and speaking of Dominic Reyes, like that is a very well-spoken man. He, I like the way he talks. Um, I like his fighting style. Uh, that was a big win over Vulcan Uzdemir, uh, close fight. I know a lot of people thought Vulcan won, but regardless, that was a big step up in competition. He, he got the win. Um, he's not ready for John Jones. No. Johnny Walker is out there melting dudes, but he's melting Justin Ledet and Jan Blakovich, who is a stud, but they're not John Jones. I mean, Tiago Santos is the guy, but, you know, Luke Rockhold, as much of a dick as he is, he brought up a good point. Like, these guys, Anthony Smith, Tiago Santos, like, man, they didn't crack the top, <laughs> what, seven at 185? And now we're expecting John or Anthony Smith and Tiago Santos now to beat John Jones. It's just not plausible. Yeah. So I, I think he fights Tiago Santos next. Now I think Tiago Santos is an exciting fighter and he will come after John Jones. But again, like we, like you just kind of alluded to, like he comes after John Jones, he's probably going to get finished because John Jones is a, John Jones is a genius in the cage. I don't think he gets enough credit for how smart he is. Yeah, no, I'm I'm obviously a huge John Jones mark, <laughs> and I think, yeah, he's he's all those guys. It, when you look at the top fifteen rankings in light heavyweight, it feels like nobody is even going to come close to challenging him. Part of that is because we're so used to John Jones as being so dominant, and eventually somebody will. One of those guys might be, you know, maybe Dominic Reyes is the guy. Even though he, I definitely agree with you, doesn't feel like he's ready. Um. I don't, I don't know. Is, is but anybody ready? But like, like, you know, this you know is just how, saying? like, I remember feeling this way about BJ Penn and then, and I thought, I thought he was going to run through Frankie Edgar and then Frankie Edgar beat him. So you never know. Um, I do think like, I'm fine with Jones waiting for, you know, kind of another fight to happen. Like a, a clear number one contenders fight. You got Corey Anderson up there as well. I don't know why Corey Anderson's ranked so low. Uh, Cause he, but Corey Anderson, John Jones. No, I'm not like, saying fight him now, but like, I I know, but to... like, they, these are the guys that we're talking about fighting John Jones. Yeah, that's my point. Yeah, I mean, but unless he goes up to heavyweight, but and he doesn't really seem super super pumped about that prospect either. Um, I need John Jones, Daniel Cormier three. I need it. I think it's the best rivalry in MMA's history. Those, I mean, they, Daniel Cormier is so good and he is such a competitor and he was demolished by John Jones, not once, but twice. He, he, like, dude, we've said this on the show before. I don't think Daniel Cormier can get, can go to bed without finding John Jones again. He could say it all he wants, but you know, like it, 
is Brock Lesnar coming back, right? You know, Daniel Cormier has already passed his his um uh he said he was going to he said he was going to retire on his 40th so birthday, right. which is today. <laughs> and he's he's definitely not retiring. So, oh, here we here we he are. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday Daniel Cormier. So, it's like it's like okay, I get it like John Jones like and again, think about money. Like, what's going to sell more? John Jones, Tiago Santos, or Daniel Cormier, John Jones 3? Whether it's at light heavyweight or heavyweight. Like, I feel like we're delaying the inevitable. Daniel Cormier is not getting any younger. Uh, the title challengers are not getting any better at light heavyweight. Like, I'm for this fight. Like, make it at heavyweight. I feel like John Jones and his coaching staff, like, they don't want to do it at heavyweight until they know that John Jones is officially going to move to heavyweight. But I don't know, man. Uh, I mean, maybe they do Tiago Santos. Daniel Cormier does a fight at heavyweight, and then they do. But again, like, if Daniel Cormier fights, like, Stipe Miocic or something, and he loses, or Francis Ngannou, and he loses, like, you're kind of uh, putting a dampening to that John Jones fight. So I have no idea. Yeah, I think do. I'm totally on board that I want to see Jones Cormier 3 more than anything. And I know, I feel like some people are, are sour on that because Jones has already beat him twice, but we've talked about it before. That it's this a, is John right. Jones could beat Daniel Cormier nine <laughs> yeah, times. Yeah, we've, in the row we've talked about it before. That this is our favorite rivalry in MMA, so I definitely want to see that happen. But I'm kind of like resigned to the fact that it it feels like it's not because each pa- with each passing day, and there's this talk about Brock and <laughs> I just, talk about Cormier fighting Steve. I know, but dude, I, think, I, I just I'm I'm pessimistic, is what I should say. Ah, uh, I just can you see Daniel Cormier retiring without getting another crack at John Jones as competitive as he is? I just can't see him. Re- and technically, technically, he didn't lose to John Jones. Twice. That's true. It wasn't no contest. That's true. So they are one zero oh, and one. Um, I just can't see him retiring without getting another crack at John Jones. And that, besides Nate Connor three, is pro- well, I. I Okay, you throw Brock Lesnar in the mix, sure. Conor McGregor is going to be the biggest. But aside from those two fights, that's got to be number three. Yeah, I actually – I wouldn't be surprised if, if DC Cor- if DC uh, Jones could do bigger numbers than like a Brock fight. But who f- the, the problem is is like we're talking about all these big fights. Like they take – you can't – like when we're talking about a fight involving Brock Lesnar or DC or Jones, anything like that, it's – we're not talking like a Cowboy Cerrone fight where they're just going to do it on three weeks notice. Like a big fight like this requires months of promotion. So it sucks that like, you know, Cormier is out here saying he wanted to retire when he's 40. Well, he turned 40 today. So fucking get with it, UFC, and, and book a fight that we actually want to see. Well, another big thing too is I know WrestleMania is coming up pretty soon. Brock Lesnar is the champion. So... I think that's going to be a big tell. I think if Brock Lesnar wins at WrestleMania, I don't think he's going to be fighting Daniel Cormier. But if he loses, that would probably pave the way for him coming back for that Daniel Cormier fight. So that's something to keep an eye on, uh, whether you're a wrestling fan or not. Yeah, it's good to know. I mean, I would not be super pumped about him coming back. I mean, it's always fun, but man... Just, just give me the fight I want to see is all I ask for. I'm getting more and more frustrated with, at all divisions of UFC matchmaking. I know. It sucks, dude. Yeah. Um, all right. Last point. Uh, my last point is – and we've kind of talked about um, UFC London a little bit, but just just kind of the main event, Masvidal starching Darren Till. I think my big question here is like is – is what, what's up with Darren Till? Is, is something – was he – overrated all along or you know something going wrong or these just rough fights um because i'm torn man i have the i have the answer yeah let's hear it jorge masvidal is criminally underrated that guy has been fighting forever he has been on the wrong end of a couple split decision losses that shouldn't have been split decision losses he's always fought the best in the division um i think that I think Darren Till's stock was a little bit rushed. Um, So I'm not going to say Darren Till was completely overrated. I just think he was a little bit rushed. I think he was a little bit overhyped. Not to the point where he's overrated, but I think a little bit overhyped. But also I think Jorge Masvidal has been criminally underrated. Jorge Masvidal is a guy that like, 
Like, okay, you see it, like, now, like, and I'm glad you brought this up, because if you didn't bring this up, I was going <laughs> to make, like, a fourth, like, caveat about this, because it needed to be talked about, but Jorge Masvidal, hey, dude, he's like a, he's like, he's like a Diaz brother from the 305. Like, he is so real in all aspects of fighting and life. Like, that guy's awesome. And, like, they should get behind a guy like that. Like, he speaks his mind. He's not afraid to speak his mind. He's smart, but he's also, like, a thug. Um, Because if you look at the Diaz brothers, like, those guys are so real, but they're also very smart in how they handle things. Like, Corey and Oswald are smart. And then he, like, he gets the win in dramatic fashion. And then he's fucking, he, he pieces up Leon Edwards backstage. He says the, you know, the three piece in a soda comment like I just think it's a mixture of Darren Till being slightly overhyped and Jorge Masvidal being severely underrated and you get this because I picked I picked Masvidal in this fight uh Masvidal's super well-rounded man he's got great striking he's tough as nails he's super savvy he's got a good wrestling good ground game um and I just – another thing too, man, I don't think welterweight's the right weight for Darren Till. Darren Till's fucking massive, dude. I just don't think that helps him at all. Um, but again, I mean Darren Till, yes, he, he got knocked out by Jorge Masvidal who I think is completely underrated. And he got choked out by Tyron fucking Woodley who is arguably – I mean if Tyron Woodley beat Kamaru Usman, he'd, he'd be up there in the GOAT conversation at welterweight. So he's lost his studs. He's not losing the bums. Um – I think Darren Till really needs to reevaluate it and think about moving up to middleweight because I don't think he'd be a small small middleweight. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I'm with you on Masvidal, and I think a lot of people that that follow MMA closely were were on Masvidal here, and I even thought like you know Till came out guns blazing and, and hurt Masvidal early, but just kind of at the the final minute of that first round, I was like Masvidal's figuring him out. Um, you could tell that he was already timing Darren Till's left hand, his attacks. Um, the setup that Masvidal used on Darren Till was fucking beautiful. The little shuffle step. So yeah, Masvidal, uh, I definitely agree with you. Super underrated here. I also, like, I hate to be on Darren Till. I hate to be the type of guy who it's like he loses two two fights in a row, the absolute elite of the division, and just count him out. Uh, but man, I think it's like hard to look back at his UFC career so far and not think, Oh, maybe this guy was not as good as we thought because he has that before Woodley. He had the really, really kind of controversial decision over Steven Thompson where nothing really much happened. He had a win over Cowboy Cerrone. Um, Cerrone's since gone back to lightweight. And then before that, you know, Boyan Velichkovic, Jessen Ayari, a draw with Nicholas Dalby. Um, so I don't know. So I do think Agre- agree. I think one uh, a, a move up to middleweight would probably do him good, but it's not going to fix a lot of problems. Like defensively, Darren Till is not good at all. Uh, he relies a ton on his size defensively, um, which would obviously not help him at middleweight. But I do think a move to middleweight would probably help his chin a little bit. Um, but I don't know, man. Like, and he also doesn't seem like a t- the type of guy that would ever consider changing up his coaching staff, but it kind of feels like yeah, it would do him a coach. lot of good right now. So I don't know. I, like I said, I hate to be the type of guy who just immediately writes off a prospect when they lose to absolutely elite fighters, which is what he's done here. Uh, but he hasn't like, you know, well, I'm, I'm just, I'm not seeing him be going to be able to compete with the elite at 170 or 185 without some real like technical adjustments. But here's the thing though, man. And and you could attest to this. Uh, MMA fans, they forget shit quick. Oh, yeah. So if Darren, Till, if Darren Till moves up to middleweight and they give him – and they're smart. And they give him a middle of their own middleweight who is not a scrub but not a world beater and he gets a, a win in dramatic fashion, we're going to be right back in that Darren Till train. Yeah. You know, so, so I think that would be good for him. And I think that people would forget these losses quick. They wouldn't forgive, but they would forget relatively quick. Um. You know, I think that the fresh weight class would do him good. I mean, you look at a guy like Luke Rockhold. They just announced that Luke Rockhold is moving up to 205. He's going to be fighting Jan Blakovich. Um I mean, I I think it'd be I think it'd be good for him. I think it would be smart for him. He's not. He's he's. The, I I think that this welterweight cut is really hurting him. 
Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, we saw that. Remember that video where he was like <laughs> almost dying trying to make uh welterweight. And I do agree, like with his like swagger and the way he talks, like two, two wins, even if it's just two wins at welterweight and he's right back there. Um, Cause he has that much kind of like star power. But for me, I mean, I'm just, I'm concerned that like his game is not as developed as, as it needs to be to compete with the absolute top of the division. Okay. Or if we're staying at welterweight, uh, we need to do Mike Perry, Darren Till. Yes. Like, remember when that yes. had the heat, like back in the day, like if he's yes. staying at welterweight, it needs to be Mike Perry. A hundred percent. 100%. Like, I don't care if Mike Perry's not ranked anymore. Who gives I don't a give a fuck. Yeah. Mike Perry's great. Like <laughs> They want to fight each I, other. Do it. That's one of those dudes where he doesn't have to be ranked, but you can still put him in top of the matchups because he 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 can fight. He's not the best. He's not the worst. But that guy on the mic is fucking hilarious. They had some beef back in the day. They had some beef, and then they also had that funny moment where with the spa thing, where Darren Till wanted to spar, but Mike Perry <laughs> thought he wanted to hit the hit the fucking spa. Like it's so funny. I love Mike Perry. Make that fight if if he's not going to middleweight, make that fight. Yeah. And, and again, no that's like that's like a middle of the road dude that like Darren Till could look excellent against and knock Mike Perry out, and then we kind of forget about Darren Till for the time being losing his last two fights. Yeah, and maybe you know what? Maybe he just needs a little bit more like time. Maybe you know, maybe he was shocked by Tyron Woodley, and then Masvidal, like you said, you know, I think everybody's going to be kind of shocked. Right? Like you said, you go from fighting Bojan Velichkovic <laughs> to Tyron Woodley, like that's a big step up. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. I think he's still got some potential, but I, I'm very concerned about his future. Rightfully so, dude. Um, all right. Do we miss anything like big in these last couple of weeks? I, obviously, Kamara Usman um, looking like a stud dominating Tyron Woodley. I did not expect that. I finally picked Tyron Woodley to win a fight and he loses. But man, Kamara Usman <laughs> looked like a beast. Um, we touched on JDS winning. Uh, Okay, here's a question really quick. If Brock Lesnar does not come back and we don't do John Jones, Daniel Cormier, who's next at heavyweight? Stipe? Ooh. Francis? Uh, JDS? Well, well, I don't know. I don't know how timing works out. I do. Th- I would like to see JDS fight in Ganu. I hope it's. I hope Stipe gets another fight because he hasn't fought in over a year now. And I don't want to see him just go right back to a rematch with DC. Was it a year ago that DC won that belt? Uh, no, it was a – oh, yes. It was less than a year ago, I should say. Stipe fought in Ganu a little over a year okay, ago. Okay, okay. So gotcha, less gotcha, than a year gotcha. ago. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I don't – in any event, I don't want to see Stipe immediately rematch uh, DC. Um, I don't know, man. I would like to see JDS fight in Ganu and the winner of that fight DC. I don't – that kind of leaves Stipe out out there. I mean, Steve, could fight maybe the winner of, um, blades and Justin Willis this weekend. That's a potential, but personally give me JDS and Ganu for a number one contender fight. Um, and Ganu's strung together some wins after a couple disappointing performances. JDS, same deal. Absolute banger. Like you just said, sign me up. Agreed, man. Um, I don't know if we missed anything, dude. I can't think. I think that's I think that's the big news. Uh, we do have some UFC this weekend. We are coming to you live from the Bridgestone Arena in Nashville, Tennessee, headlined by Stephen Thompson taking on Anthony Pettis. What a weird fight! Um, I guess it kind of makes sense for Stephen Thompson because as long as Tyron Woodley was the champion and all these budding contenders in the division like Colby Covington, Darren Till, uh. Kamara Usman, Stephen Thompson wasn't getting a title shot anytime soon, but it's a very weird pairing. You know, Anthony Pettis uh, coming off the Tony Ferguson loss, but man, that's a tough motherfucker. I mean, dude, if you look at Anthony Pettis' resume, like, man, that guy has fought some studs. And now he's moving up to welterweight. Um, It's going to be a fun fight. It's not going to be a guy that is going to grind out uh, Anthony Pettis. Um, but also, he's not a guy that, you know, Stephen Thompson is not a guy that's going to really buzzsaw through Anthony Pettis like Tony Ferguson did. So I kind of, 
I don't think it's a good matchup for Pettis, but I don't necessarily think it's a bad matchup for him jumping up to welterweight because I picked Pettis over Tony Ferguson because I thought Pettis in his win prior to the Tony Ferguson fight over uh, um, Michael Chiesa and even his fight with Dustin Poirier, he lost, but he looked really good. He almost looked like the Pettis of old. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily a bad fight. It's just a weird fight. Yeah, I'm with you on all that. And yeah, I mean, if talk about Pettis just refusing to ever take a step back. Like here he is. We all think with that loss to Tony Ferguson, um, and you know he hasn't strung together consecutive victories since since he is, since his title run since 2013, time. 2014. Um, so after the loss to Ferguson, I kind of thought, all right maybe finally Pettis will take a step back in this division and fight somebody who's like outside the top 10. Nope. He's fucking fighting dude. Steven Thompson. Dude. Okay. Okay. Listen to this. Listen to these names. I'm about to name you. Are you ready? Since 2000, 2010, 2010, Ben Henderson, Clay Guida, Jeremy Stevens, Joe Lozon, Donald Cerrone, Ben Henderson, Gilbert Melendez, Dos Anjos, Eddie Alvarez, Edson Barbosa, Charles Oliveira, Max Holloway, Jim Miller, Dustin Poirier, Michael Chiesa, Tony Ferguson. Dude, that is fucking crazy. Yeah. That is a, a lot of studs. Like, think about all those guys I just named and think about how many wins those guys have at the highest level. I mean, not one of those dudes, like, at some point in those in their careers, like those dudes were top five in the world, uh, or at least top ten. I mean, dude, his resume is nuts. Yeah, it really is, man. Um, and I hope when he retires, he gets credit for that because his record is not his record is not going to look phenomenal, but he should get credit for for always taking difficult fights. And I also agree with you. You said that like this is not a great fight for Pettis. Like, obviously, I think both you and I pick pick wonder boy to get the win here but i don't i am picking anthony pettis (laughs) well i'll tell you why i think it's closer than the odds indicate i'm still picking wonder boy but what are the odds by the way i'm trying to pull up best fight odds right now and for whatever reason their website is out but earlier today i saw pettis is like a plus 335 underdog and i think that's that's too wide i think the issue is thompson like like if you give pettis space to work um, he's always going to be a dangerous guy. And he hasn't fought a guy like Steven Thompson, a guy that's just going to give him space to work since maybe Max Holloway. And even then, Max Holloway was pressuring. So Thompson will give Pettis space and time to work. Um, and presumably Pettis will have a speed advantage. I think especially probably with his, well, probably with any strike, Pettis probably has the speed advantage. I think I just picked Thompson here based on recent performances and size. Like Thompson came into the UFC as a middleweight and, and fucking Anthony Pettis fought for a title at 145. So I think size and durability at this point are, are the biggest factors here weighing against Anthony Pettis. I'm with you, man, but Thompson's getting up there in age. He's 36 years old. Um, Hasn't been all that active recently. He fought he fought a few times in 2016. He only fought once in 2018. I lost, man, Darren Till again. Like, Darren Till should not have beat Steven Thompson, <laughs> by the way. Ah, oh, fuck. Maybe, maybe I'm going to, maybe, any, any, man, fuck. Steven Thompson also <laughs> beat Jorge Masvidal pretty soundly. Probably could have beaten Tyron Woodley in one of those fights. I think it's Stephen Thompson. <laughs> like, I don't know why the fuck I said well, Anthony Pettis. I think I just like. I, I think, think I just like. I think if you're gambling, um, if you have to make a bet, you got to bet on Pettis at plus three thirty five. That those odds I are. No, I know. Pettis is just a tough motherfucker. Like he's he's jumping up, man. That's that's pretty badass. Um, yeah, uh, I'm probably <laughs> gonna pick Stephen Thompson, <laughs> but but it's a it's a it's a, it's a fun fight regardless. Like. I think it's a fun fight, and it's a it's a bigger fight for Stephen Thompson than Anthony Pettis because if Anthony Pettis wins, like he could drop to fifty five, he could stay at one seventy. For Stephen Thompson, we have a new champion, so if he wants to get one more shot at the title, he needs to win this fight one hundred percent. So there's some pretty high stakes to the fight, 
as random as yeah, it is. I agree. and I I with I'm with you. Just I was just on MMAJunkie.com and they had a they were running an article, um, just some fluff piece. Uh, but Stephen Thompson essentially said, you know, now with Usman as the champion, I you know he's he wants to make a run at the title again because he with Woodley out. So. Yeah, agreed. This is probably his last chance to do it. Hundred percent. He's not getting yeah. any younger. Um, and you have a new title challenger, so or a new title uh, holder. Yeah, this is his time. Um, other than that, man, you know, Curtis Blades, Justin Willis, um, Curtis Blades was on a run, but he was knocked out really quickly in his last fight. So, I mean, you know what, dude? Heavyweight is all of a sudden kind of interesting. <laughs> you got Francis and Ganu looking like a killer again. You still got Stipe hanging out. DC's the champ. Um, Heavyweight kind of looks interesting again. And it's kind of cool to see. Like, Heavyweight was kind of like so meh for so long. JDS is looking like JDS again. Kane <laughs> had a fight for the first time since fucking 1996. Um, so again, it leaves a guy like Curtis Blades kind of uh, meh. Justin Willis, I don't know. Um, well, heavyweight, I don't know. Heavyweight is so Should wild that fight. it can turn over so quickly. You know, guys get get knockouts real quick. Kind of like what we're seeing at light heavyweight a little bit. There can be just such quick turnover. Curtis Blades, two two losses, but um. Still is a guy with tons of potential, especially at heavyweight. He's he might be. I was looking up his age. Curtis Blades is twenty eight years old, which is a fucking baby at heavyweight. So, yeah, there's still it is it yeah, is interesting. It is, it we is. talked about Ngannou and whatnot, but he has a great skill set for heavyweight too. It's just uh, there's guys hit like fucking trucks, and he was on the wrong end of that truck the last fight. You so. know what? I honestly compare Curtis Blades to though Stepe Miocic. Stipe was was knocked clean by uh, Stefan Struve. Struve, yeah. Stefan, and, and we all kind of wrote off Stipe because Stipe similar skill set to Curtis Blades with pretty good wrestling, but not like DC level wrestling, and has decent striking, is a good athlete, but not going to like blow you out of the water. Uh, don't don't sleep on Curtis Blades being a champion in like seven years or some wild shit because that's how heavyweight works. Yeah. That's true, man. Um, the real fight I'm looking forward to on this card and of this weekend is Juicy A. Formiga and Davison Figueredo. It is a really, really good fight. Oh, man. And I, f- like, I feel for Formiga. Like, Formiga coming into – again, like, Formiga coming into the UFC was, if not the best flyweight in the world, like one of the best flyweights in the world. And he's kind of, like, alternated wins and losses his whole career. And now he's on a three fight win streak and it feels like if he gets this win, like he's fighting for a title, but oh wait, they're, they might cancel that division. So it's like, it feels like a big fight. And again, he's going against Davis and Figueredo, who's a stud in his own right. I mean, Figueredo is, uh, dude, he's, he's 15 and 0, um, 4 and 0 in the UFC, but like, are they fighting for a title shot or are they fighting just to fight? Are they, you know, what, what this fight is so good, so compelling. I love it. But is there any real ramifications to this fight or are they just going to cancel the division? Like, I don't know. Again, it, it all, it, it hinges on, uh, Henry Cejudo. Like now that T.A. Dillashaw is out, is he still going to go up to 35 or is he going to stay at 25 or then he keep 25? Like it's such a great fight with so many things, uh, left unanswered. Yeah, man. Something we've been talking about, it feels like all of 2019 so far, is it's hard to get invested in a fight if you don't know what the ramifications are. Um, and I, I will be invested. I'm with you. This is a phenomenal fight. Really closely matched, like high skill fight. But I it would be I'd be so much more into it if I knew this was a number one contender fight because I knew the fight would actually mean something. Um, the fight itself, like I said, great i actually like figueredo here i think he is a just a f- savage I do too. and a really 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 good athlete um but you know figueredo or not figueredo sorry um formiga been around forever so like part of me kind of wouldn't be shocked if he catches him with like a cute submission or some sort of uh kind of surprise strike something like that but figueredo is who is is who i favor here just because he is a 
what we've seen in the UFC, at least he's just been a, a fucking savage and an incredible athlete from what I've seen as well. Yeah, man, I agree. Uh, other than that, dude, this is a pretty, it's another one of those cards when you have a card every week, got a couple really solid fights and then it's mixed with, uh, I don't want to say middle of the road people, but uh, Macy Barber's interesting. Bryce Mitchell, uh, Luis Pena, uh, Frankie Sines, and Marlon Vera should be a banger, but nothing too crazy aside from two or three fights. Yeah, this is how it goes. Uh, just like you said, they're, they got to fill these ESPN plus um, time slots. Hey, really quick before we uh, end this, two things that just popped into my head. Uh, Invicta, you're a big Invicta guy. I know you go to all their shows. Um, they are doing, and you could probably talk about this a little bit more than me. They are doing a, I believe, eight woman one night tournament, which is awesome. It kind of brings it back to like uh, old school pride days. Am I correct with that? Yeah. One night tournament. I think it's the first two rounds are maybe a, it's a one round fight. And then the final round is a regular three round fight. I think <clears throat> I might not be a hundred percent, but I think they're doing, um, one fifteen. You got Kalen Curran who, who was in the UFC for a while coming back. Uh, I think That's there's cool. a couple other, a couple other UFC vets, um, Invicta vets, I'm pumped. It's going to be here in Kansas City. Um, I've, I'm trying to think of all the years that I've been watching MMA. I don't think I've ever witnessed a live um, single night tournament. So I am, I am very jacked for it. I know that's awesome. It's a throwback, man. Invicta is doing great things. They don't get enough credit again for what they do, but women's they, MMA, I, they are the, they are the flag bearer, man. They're awesome. They, they signed Jimmy Smith too as a, as a yes, of that. yes, yes. One hundred percent. It's awesome. That dude always deserves a job. I was super upset that he got let go from the UFC, but happy that he's back on an Invicta. Um, one more thing for me. I don't know if you got anything else, but for me, this is big for me personally. But Connecticut is holding their first sanctioned event next Friday, um, and this is their first sanctioned event that is outside the casinos. So they are going to be doing CES. Live from Hartford, Connecticut. Um, like I said, their first sanctioned event. So this is big for Connecticut. Uh, one of the only states, I won't say only, it might actually be one of the only states that hasn't had a sanctioned event yet. Um, they just legalized MMA. So this is big for us. Matt Passett's on the card. UFC vet. Dan Dubuque, man. Dan Dubuque, who we've had him on our show. Good friend of mine. Um, he's going to mop the floor with this dude. He's fighting and he's going to get a UFC contract. In his next fight, he's about to be eight and two stud. Watch out for him. It's fucking great, man. New England is one of the, in my opinion, one of the biggest hotbeds of MMA in the country. It is, man. It sure is. Um, Dude, I don't, don't think I have anything else, man. Honestly, I'm just glad to be back. It's been a busy couple weeks, but hopefully we'll get back on track. Um, We are now on Spotify. So all you people that don't, uh, subscribe to us on iTunes or Google Play or go to the Combat Socket website, combatsocket.com. We are on Spotify, so plenty of spots to get us. I believe we're on YouTube too, so whether you have iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, YouTube, combatsocket.com, check us out. Please rate us, subscribe, give us a review, a good review. <laughs> we appreciate it. Yeah, man. That's about it for me. Yep, same here. So we will talk to you next week. Enjoy the fights. There is a Bellator card this weekend too. Uh, Manuel Sanchez taking on Georgie Carhanian. Uh Never can get enough MMA. Also, man, I got to I gotta say it. NCAA Wrestling, the best weekend in the world. Best tournament in the world. Screw all that basketball nonsense. NCAA Wrestling, March Madness. Check it out. Mm-hmm.